Well, good afternoon. If you are on the Upper East Side of Manhattan in New York City or in Connecticut or who knows where else in, in North America, good evening. If you are in Salzburg or Berlin or Venice uh, or many parts of Africa, and good day if you are in Melbourne, Australia, where I know we have listeners. Um, welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Adagio, the place where classical music happens. As you know by now, Adagio is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera and all kinds of music available to fans all around the world. My guest today is someone whose work I admire. As far as I know, we've never actually met in person. We will remedy that soon. Uh, he joins me, I'm guessing, from the east side of Manhattan. Okay. And I'm on the west side of Manhattan. These are two different worlds. But, <laughs> but they're very close. And we're, I'm just going to get this out of the way now for people who don't know. Central Park is 100% on the west side of Manhattan, as is the Metropolitan Museum of Art. But there is a magnificent cultural institution, on, definitely on the east side of Manhattan. We call it in New York the 92nd Street Y. It's gone by different names for the years. And Nicholas Russotto is the Tisch Music Director, I think that's your title, of the 92nd Street Y. So welcome, Nick. Do you prefer Nick or Nicholas? Nick is fine. And thanks so much, Fred. It's such a pleasure to be with you. And, and I should say for any West Siders, we do stamp passports, you know, right at the <laughs> right at the West side of Lexington Avenue. So it's a very easy crosstown experience. Yes, except for the toll booth on the crosstown bus on 96th Street. <laughs> I think I think Kathy Hochul got rid of that one, too. <laughs> okay, That's our governor. Um, by the way, Nick, I meant to tell you, we have listeners all over the world, as you know, so therefore we're going to if we talk about Kathy Hulk, when people may not know that is, she's the governor of the state of New York. Um, Nick, I'd like to start with a very big question. Could you give people all around the world some sense of the history and the meaning of the 92nd Street Y, or whatever name we want to call it? Sure, um, I'm happy to. Um, the 92nd Street Y currently lives on, as the name might suggest, uh, 92nd Street and Lexington Avenue, which is on the east side of Manhattan, on the Upper East Side. Um, it was originally founded as the Young Men's Hebrew Association and started life much further downtown. Um, it was, uh, to, to paraphrase uh, somewhat, it was originally founded by sort of the first generation of Jewish immigrants to New York, mostly German Jews. Um, for every subsequent generation of Jewish immigrant, by the time they had founded a lot were still coming in from Germany and then Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and essentially it was founded in order to educate and house these uh, subsequent generations of Jewish immigrants. So um, at various points um, in its history, it's had a significant residence section. It's been a major educational institution, a significant cultural institution. Um, music was part of, uh, of the wise, um, offerings almost from its founding with significant, um, music, uh, coming in the 1930s under Dr. William Kolodny, who sort of helped to make the why what most people think of it as today. Um, it moved further and further uptown, gradually landing, um, in the early 1920s on 92nd and Lexington Avenue. Um, the first building that currently exists was built in the late 1920s, finished around 1928, 1929, which houses both of our main concert venues, a 900 seat concert hall in dark paneled mahogany. It's a gorgeous room, as you well know. And then uh, a smaller space, which is somewhat more flexible, called Buttonweiser Hall, which seats about 200 people. Um, but the, the, the sort of central ethos of the Y has not changed in that um, many people still live at the Y, usually college students or folks with semesters abroad um, or young interns doing their sort of uh, work in the city. Um, you can take any number of classes from bridge to canasta to jewelry making to foreign language. You can send your children to nursery school. You can send them to swimming lessons. There's a gym that takes up um, a significant portion of two floors of the building. Um, 
And then there are a lot of different kinds of cultural options, um, whether in literature or poetry, talks by all sorts of major thinkers of all different stripes from Bill and Hillary Clinton and Michelle Obama to David Rubenstein to, um, to Fern Malice, a wonderful fashion writer and editor uh, who does lots of talks with designers. Um, you can really hit anything. And that's before we even talk about the music, which is my little corner of the building. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty special place. And you may not remember because you're a young guy, but there used to be a very popular rye bread in New York City that you could buy in stores as opposed to a bakery called Levi's, L-E-V-I-S. And they would always have pictures of Native Americans, of Chinese, of Black people, of Latinos, of people from every part of the world eating a sandwich with Levi's rye bread. And the ad line for years was, you don't have to be Jewish to love Levi's. And so it's not <laughs> it's not the genes, it's, it's rye bread. And similarly, you don't in any way have to be Jewish to stay at, to attend, to be part of the community of the 92nd Street Y. It's Hebrew back in the day, in the 1870s, meant Jewish to a lot of people. So it's not about the language. Even in Italian now, Ebreo, Hebrew, means a Jewish person. So, and it's also the language Hebrew. So people sometimes think that it's an institution that either promoted Judaism and so on. It was from a time when Jews were not allowed into mainstream society in New York. And the Germans, particularly in back in Germany, built something called a Bund, B-U-N-D, which is like a social organization right. to help people get on their way. So these were German Jews, as you said, who created this organization for immigrants, for um, people who had social needs of social services and so on. And to this day, the 92nd Street Y, also definitely for the entire community, not just Jews at all, fulfills that social need um, things like um, older people, caregiver programs, things like that. In every phase of life, the 92nd Street Y has something, as you said, from the littlest children to the very oldest people. Um, and yes, in the middle of this magnificent institution also happens to be a world-class music program. And that's what makes a difference, say, from Lincoln Center, Carnegie Hall, although Carnegie Hall certainly does a lot of social programming, many arts institutions in America certainly do it, especially New York City, and we're going to get into that. But um, do you think that there are still people who perceive it as like a Jewish place, and therefore if you're not Jewish, you don't get to go there? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's definitely the case. Uh, in fact, you know, I you know I've been at the Y about, uh, just about seven years now, and I'm still surprised. Is still sometimes expressed to me that I you know have an Italian a Sicilian surname, in fact, um, and I'm an Episcopalian and work at a Jewish institution. But to to your point, Fred, I think that you know a really important part of the Y's mission and and ethos is that we are both a community center and a cultural center. And among the communities that we serve, and indeed the foundational underpinning of the organization is a sense of Jewish values founded by Jews, still espouses Jewish values, um, still serves a Jewish community, but it also serves the entirety community in the neighborhood in which it sits and indeed the whole city. And then the entire city's cultural life as well. And correct so me- No need to be wrong. Jewish at all. Right, do we rye bread? Oh, absolutely. Of course. Okay. Correct me if you think I'm wrong, but um, the term Jewish values could be interpreted in many ways. Um, there is something in Judaism and secular Judaism known as Yiddishkeit. And Yiddishkeit is basically the values of humanity, of sharing. Uh, the labor union movement in America was founded on Yiddishkeit. Yiddishkeit always loves a good sense of humor. So Sholem Aleichem, the Fiddler on the Roof stories, are Yiddish kaitas. They're not religious per se, although they're aware, they're cognizant of the Jewish religion. Um, the Jewish religion per se is not one religion. There are many forms of practice of it. You know, the old joke is, what do you get when you put three Jews in a room, five opinions? And so... <laughs> 
So <laughs> just as easily said about arts programmers, I think. It's true. Oh, okay, <laughs> there we go. That's that's where I was heading. <laughs> but the thing is, I really I I'm saying this as a New Yorker that I really want everyone, whether you're from New York or not, to know that it is as much a New York cultural institution as Carnegie Hall, the Metropolitan Opera, the New York Philharmonic, Lincoln Center, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, the Cloisters, um, Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Museum, BAM, Brooklyn Academy of Music, which is magnificent as a place, and in many ways similar to the 92nd Street Y because they're from the same era, they serve different constituencies because New York City didn't become New York City until 1898. So therefore, Brooklyn Academy of Music was not Jewish, but it was very community oriented and arts oriented for Brooklyn and 92nd Street Y for Manhattan. Remember, Carnegie Hall did not open until 1891. And therefore, many of the venues that we talk about in New York City either no longer exist or did not exist when the Y was founded in 1874. So it is that historic. So having established that for our worldwide audience, um, I would like to talk to you about the fact you are not new to the place, but you are relatively new in your job in that the coming season, which is to say the 2024-2025 season of music, was the first one that you programmed entirely. And I want you to help teach our international audience something that I know a lot about because I've lived it my whole life, but is very hard to explain to people who don't do it. Namely, how does a person who's responsible for a theater, a venue, an auditorium, which is sometimes also an educational institution, sometimes, um, program music. Is there a sense of mission that comes with it? Are there directives? Or, and this is a very big question, Nick, right up front, do you program based on what you think your audience wants or what they should get to know <laughs> or both? <laughs> You tell me, what is your philosophy, Nick's philosophy as a programmer? Um, I think the answer to all of those questions is yes. Mm -hmm. um, it is, it is as you say, Fred, a really hard thing to explain to people who don't do it, but let me see if I can. Um, and if I can't, well, I'll just be the latest in a long line of people who don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's... I think the first thing when thinking about building a season, when programming a season is to look at um, where the institution had been, you know, one, one can't do this in a vacuum and everything that we do needs to have a sense of trajectory, a sense of arc to it. Um, I, I, I was, I'm very lucky as, as you mentioned, as I mentioned that I've been at the Y now for some time. So I've seen, uh, uh, several different iterations now of the music programming. Um, I was originally brought on by Hannah Arya Geifman, a legend in New York in her own right. Um, she was succeeded by Amy Lamb, who had been artistic director of the Celebrity Series in Boston, another legend in her own right. Uh, and I succeeded Amy uh, last year. So I've seen... And a legend in the making. Different... <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, let's see if the check clears first. <laughs> um I, so, so I've seen, you know, Hannah's very, very intellectual Eurocentric approach uh, and worked with her a great deal in honing and shaping that. Um, Amy came and started to broaden our perspectives and our sensibilities, questioning why the Y does X, but not Y, um, or Z as it were. Z. Um, <laughs> yeah. we, we do Y very well. Um <laughs> And so I've been helping shape and, and, and steward those conversations for some time. And so I've arrived at this point with a pretty good understanding of where we've been in recent years. And then, of course, taking, uh, taking as well into account Michael Barrett's work, um, Omas Hirschbein's work, uh, and Dr. Kolodny's work. Um, Old people legends, he, too, who changed the direction of the why in terms of music. Um, but also, I would say, responded to changing audiences, not audience taste, 
but just who the population was in New York City. Yeah, quite, quite so. And, you know, especially in William Culloden's time and then Omus's, Omus Hirschbein's time, you know, Omus was at the Y for a, a, a very, very lengthy period of just 25-ish years, something like that. Yeah, quite a, quite a while. And, and, and so he perhaps most shaped what we think of as the current programming style at the Y, which I think it would be fair to say is ever so slightly left of center it's it's great artists doing projects that are meaningful to them um it has a really strong intellectual engagement with the content of a program um and is always seeking to question and provide broader context for the work that it does just to clarify so, do you mean politically yeah. left of center or just a bit out of the norm i, I mean a bit out of the norm um it, yeah, I, I don't. I don't mean it any in any political sense at all. I mean just a little off piece. Um, and so, I look at all of that, and then I look at the larger musical context that we live in in New York, in New York City, that is in the state, in the metropolitan area, the U.S. and the world, and think, well, okay, how the heck do we build a season from here? And and it's really a combination of every piece that you've elucidated. It is something of what an audience wants, something of what I think an audience should get, always with a sense of direction. And I say that to say that I'm always thinking about how what I do this season gets me something next season, which gets me something the following season. In other words, um, we're always building platforms for things that we want to do next year, the following year, the year after that. Um, if, for example, I see an opening for Baroque music um, in our programming, which, which I do, and as a matter of fact, which we started to have done as a result of other institutions in New York doing less of it, um, we start building well, a framework with Bennett. some big marquee level Bulletproof. names. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> we we start building a framework for that by bringing in some marquee level names, folks, uh, you know, uh, institutions, organizations, um, ensembles, well known to New York audiences, bring them to the Y. Um, and then we start to build our own kind of programming as an outgrowth of that work. Um, so, it, and, and we do this always with a sense of what kind of stories do we want to tell? What, um, what the market says should appear on our stages combined with what we think the market is telling us. Um, and then you throw it all up against the wall and you negotiate the fees and do the contracts and hope that it's a season that people will find inspiring. Fingers crossed. And now I'm going to get to something very logistical that I know all about, but I'm not the one here to tell it. You are. Um, let's say artist A. Let's a German pianist, okay? It does, well, I'm not thinking of anyone, but let's say a German pianist who lives in Germany and has most of her activities in Germany and in Central Europe uh, and occasionally will venture out from Central Europe. Um, would you want or try to be in a position to bring this German pianist to the 92nd Street Y or... Does her management contact you and say, um, pianist A is thinking of a North American tour that will include five cities to do a program all Schumann? And are you interested in that? Um, do you say, yes, but we're not interested in Schumann or we love pianist day she can play whatever she wants how does that work and but the first part of the question is would you just bring her over to new york if she's not doing a tour in north america i think to, the answer to the first question is an unqualified maybe um it is it is always easier to do things on a tour um certainly um, but it really depends. I mean, so much of the answer to that question is who the specific artist is, what they're wanting to do at any particular moment in time, and and frankly, how much the person in my job likes that artist. You know mm -hmm. how 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 strongly we feel 
that that artist is someone worthy of showcasing in New York, um, how much we think that that is a really important part of our season. Um, if we think that it's a very, very important thing for us to do, then, I, I, you know, we, we're very lucky in New York that we have the ability to do that. Um, but certainly it's easier to bring people on tour. Um, it's easier when a manager calls and says, you know, we're, we're booking a tour. Here's the range of possibilities. Here's the program or programs usually. Um, to, to the middle part of that question about programs specifically, most of the time I feel like these days we're given a couple of options and then maybe some things that can be swapped in and out. Um, and we tend to work with the manager and sometimes if we know them with the artist directly to figure out what the best program will be for our audience and our city. Um, I, I will say that being in New York, we sometimes get artists having a very strong sense of what they want to play in New York for a New York audience. Um, so sometimes we don't end up with the usual program A or B or C kind of option. Um, but so much of this depends on who the artist is, what they are passionate about, what we think is the best showcase and best platform for them. And it's usually a dance between me and the manager and the artist to arrive at that perfect constellation of thing. Sometimes it's very, very logistical. Well, somebody else is playing the Schumann Symphonic Etudes this year and we'd rather not duplicate. However, um, on, the, on the newly announced season, we actually have two artists um, who are bo both playing Brahms Handel variations. Um, okay. One person had put in the program very, very early and I said, absolutely great program, fabulous. The other person had come along somewhat later with the same piece on and I said to the manager, you know, just so you are aware and the artist is aware there is someone else who's got this on the program. And they said, well, we actually really do feel strongly about it. And I looked at the artists and I thought there'll be such different versions of that piece, such different mm -hmm. sound worlds, such different conceptions of the way that piece works that why not yeah. hold them both up and say, this will be really fascinating. And they happen to be on opposite ends of the season, which always helps. And, you know, it's never bad to hear Brahms handle variations twice. But also, you know, the use of phrase that it's overused, but it's good. It's a teaching moment that mm -hmm. a smart critic from a newspaper will come by and, and write about both, even if they're months apart, and how those interpretations differ and, and maybe how the first interpretation resonated in him or what he heard in the second one. There's a good article there, and I would love if our local journalistic institutions would do more of that. They do some. I'm not here to knock them, but it's hard to get classical music coverage into the paper. But um, it, I it is, and then of course, to your point, that that kind of coverage would be very, very interesting for you and I to read. But to figure out a way to write it in such a way that the massive online audience of any one of our local journals right. might be interested in might take a little more doing but gosh i do hope someone writes that that'd be fun yeah well frankly i can tell you although you know this but listeners need to know it part of your job as a presenter is and you have pr firms who work for you to instill that idea to think of who might be the right person to write that article and make sure that she or he or they are available on the dates when this music will be done that's right um so here's another question that's completely related. I've been pondering, do I name names or not? I will name one name and not the other. Um, I was mentored early in my training and career by artist Kranick, a legend in the opera world. She was general director of the Lyric Opera of Chicago, and she got me like the prime of Miss Jean Brody. You have to get them when they're impressionable. She <laughs> got me when I was very impressionable and, and open to learning. And uh there was a very famous, world famous soprano who worked a lot with Herbert von Karian, sang a lot at the Met, what was a particular favorite at the Lyric Opera Chicago. An artist made sure to have this particular soprano every season in a major role because the soprano developed a Chicago audience. She was from Europe, but somehow Chicagoans knew to pronounce her unpronounceable name and turned out and always bought tickets 
to hear this artist, whether it was Aida or La Traviata or Manon Lascaux, whatever the opera was, um, a German work at one point, Ariadne of Naxos, but whatever the opera was, artist Kranich made sure to present her in Chicago. That went on for 11 years. And then the artist was not on the program in the 12th year. And I said, was she not available? And artist Kranich said, no, she was available, but I have presented her in everything that she's worth hearing in. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, you know, maybe they did not hear her in La Traviata 10 years ago. And Arda said, and they should not hear her in La Traviata now. I'm getting goosebumps as I say this because she said it with complete love and compassion, but also as a business person and who felt responsible to her audience and that she had to bring her audience the best at that date. And this soprano, in an artist's view, not mine, but I, maybe I was being a little too sentimental, had nothing else to offer the audiences in Chicago. And I said, but you're going to still sell tickets because people love this soprano and Herbert von Karajan still uses her. And artist said, Yes, but I don't. <laughs> and, you know, that was that's called tough love. And it was tough love, not only for the soprano in question, but it was for me because she was teaching me hard lessons. But I understand where she was coming from completely. So do audiences tire of artists, even if they're really good and venerable and are there certain artists that one can keep bringing and they do something new but other artists who you just say maybe we've had everything this artist can offer us um i think that i think that we're in a we're in a period of pretty significant change in audience behavior so i don't know if there's enough data at least in my mind, yet to answer that question in the in the present moment and the current day. I think that certainly, e even up till COVID, I'll say, um, with presenting organizations still relying on subscription bases and, and certainly orchestras doing the same thing, um, there is a certain amount of comfort in what I guess you could call security blanket programming, right? Artist A is well-known and well-loved, and we have had Artist A every year on the subscription series, whether in recital or, or with a concerto, for 15 years, and we've not come close to exhausting their recital or concerto repertoire, so we can sort of keep rebooking. On the other hand, I do think that sense of inevitability, to, to Artist's point, there is a time at which I feel like the bloom could come off the rose slightly where an audience says, I mean, there, there's a, there's a danger of it seeming routine, right? And, and you and I both know that there is no aspect of our business, certainly not what happens at stage starting at 732 is routine. Mm -hmm. So one runs the risk of having an audience show up without a sense of excitement, you know, just with a sense of, oh, it's Sartre to stay again and they'll do a great job in Rock 3 because they did a great job in Mozart 9 last year or what have you. Um, but there are some artists, or, or rather I should say there are some artist-audience combinations that seem evergreen and ever fresh. There's always a sense of, uh, you know, a sense of excitement, a sense of intrigue in the air when artist B shows up to town. Um, so I, I, I guess I have no real answer to this question, except to say, we always have to balance these, these competing priorities, right? We have to, at the same time, provide audiences with the highest level of music making at the current moment, to, to yours and, well, artists via you's point, we have to we have to keep engaging new and exciting talent so we are not just running out the clock on what artist a or b is able to do for us 
without having people who are able to move into artists A or B's shoes in due course. And we have to provide an audience the sense of excitement and wonder that comes with hearing a great concert, a great performance. It's hard to do all three of those things at the same time if you're just forever returning to the same well of two or three or five or 10 people. But luckily, at least in, in my instance, you know, between, we probably have about 35 classical music concerts, another 15, 10 to 15 jazz, counting our summer jazz series, another five or six American songbook, and then our lyrics and lyricists sort of edutainment American songbook series. There's enough space to go around. There's enough space to do the something borrowed, something old, something new, something blue. You know, obviously, I've never been married. So I can't can't rattle that one off. Um, we'll see, obviously, I don't know. <laughs> there's, a, there's enough. There's enough. There's enough space for me to do all of that. I think it probably gets a lot more difficult when you're talking about a smaller series with more precious or fewer and more precious slots. And probably more difficult still when you're talking about touring orchestras, for example, which have you know, maybe there are 10 or 15 orchestras worldwide with major touring properties. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that number seems to be lessening. Um, but I'm getting away from myself. I, I think all of this is a balance. Um, and indeed, the hardest part of it is to always be listening critically to the recital that is being presented in front of you. Because I think all of us be can become very sentimental about certain artists or certain repertoire that makes it very, very difficult for us to be able to hear with fresh ears the, the tenth time that somebody comes. Um, but, but the people in, in our position, unfortunately, have to sit in the hall and think, is it time? Was this a bad night? Is it time to think about reshuffling our priorities um and and i i admire artists uh tenacity in, in doing that because you know well, <laughs> it, it's it's not it's it's not an it's not an easy thing to do and those are not easy conversations to have but very important for the continued vitality of the profession i think i'm going to tell you prompted a memory and i'm going to tell another artist credit story just because you know, you and I and people like us learn from people like that. Um, Chicago, the, I would say the Lyric Opera Chicago, as every major opera company passes a, a big threshold when they build a ring cycle. And Artist Kranich got the money, the organization, the artists, in other words, the singers, the designers, to do a complete ring cycle. And Zubin Mehta conducted, and it was terrific. And um, they had it after in storage. And I was speaking to her one day and I said, well, when are you bring back the ring? She said, I'm not. Why not? Well, because we did it and we made our money. We made our impression. It's too expensive to bring it back. And in fact, you can imagine my trembling at the thought. I'm going to burn Rheingold, Siegfried, and go to Damerung and only keep Volkura. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful production because I can rent out Volkura and make money for the company. I have to pay storage on the other three and I don't need them. You know, I mean... Was was the burning all accompanied by the Magic Fire music? Or? <laughs> <laughs> practically. Um, she, just, she basically trashed it, but kept the Volkura to use as a rental because <laughs> although she was profoundly focused on music and art and adventure and all that, she never took her eyes off the bottom line because Lyric Opera Chicago and before it other opera companies in the wonderful city of Chicago went bankrupt or had terrible financial problems. And her predecessor nearly bankrupted the company. I won't go into too much detail due to inattention, due to various bad investments. And artists, when she came in, basically said, we cannot have that. So she made these decisions that were financial. And this leads me to another question. I should say, too, at that time, they had a wonderful subscription model. 
so that people, there was a guy named Danny Newman who wrote a book about how to build subscription audiences. He was there and they did a lot of things really well. They were commissioning new opera works. They brought in people like Catherine Malfitano to be the next soprano after the one we were not talking about. And Catherine had many wonderful years in Chicago doing all kinds of roles. And then I don't think there was a breakup. I think Catherine just moved on to other things. Um, and but Catherine maintained a wonderful relationship with the company. But not every company does that. So my question for you is, let's say that you present an artist who you know is very fine, who may not have a New York audience, who may, let's call it this German pianist we're talking about, who comes in with the Schumann program and does a wonderful program artistically to a house that sold one third. Um, is it your fault institutionally, not you personally, that it didn't sell better, that it was not promoted? Is it the fault of the manager who did not get the panel's name out? Is it the program? How, how can you do a post-mortem and decide, yes, artistically it was magnificent, but do we have her back or we just say we had this artist in our history? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I think that it's it can often be very difficult in the postmortem to see what went wrong, and and I would say that that's largely because it's rarely one thing. Um, certainly, it's possible that the institution did not market something correctly or well, or didn't find the right audience, didn't find the right social media targets. You know, our PR department didn't get a good press listing, which often does help with advanced sales. Um, it's entirely plausible. Um, you know, I, I, I rarely find a, a reason to blame management for these things, except to the extent that they might not be encouraging their artists, especially younger ones, to post about their engagements on their social medias or, or sort of directly engage with their following. Um, and, and that itself is very important. Um, it could be, especially in a city like New York, just that the audience is spoiled for choice. Um, you know, we who do this in New York aren't always so good at talking to one another about um, what's going on <laughs> bef before okay. we announce our seasons. So <laughs> sometimes another institution will announce their season and then I'll announce mine. I go, oh, damn it. Yep. You know, no one's coming to this thing because somebody else has the the Berlin Philharmonic or something like that. Um, you know, these things, they happen. Um, but what I will say is that it's, it would be rare for me to call something quits after only trying it once because so much of what we do is about audience building over time that taking our, our German pianist, for, for instance, um, if I admire that person's artistry enough to bring them to the Y, if I feel strongly about showing them in New York, um, it would be very, it would be a very, very strange circumstance indeed if I did not, and, and we sold a third of the house. I would actually find that fairly encouraging. Um, certainly that would suggest there's work to do, but if we re-engage that person, say for the, the subsequent season or the, or the nearest subsequent season for which we're booking, um, and we saw maybe 30 more people bought tickets. I'd count that a win. Um, I think we're actually growing an audience for this performer. Um, you know, if we rebooked and we sold less, we might try again. We might try a different style of program, you know, especially if the programs were similar as they sometimes can be with, with artists of a certain caliber who really feel strongly about a certain kind of music. Um, but I, I tend to think very much from a from a building things over time perspective where do we start and if it's a third sold house okay um but where do we go from there and how do we ensure a better result next time how do we continue to build an artist uh, an audience rather and a profile for that artist um now to 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 do the the dirty bottom line this is always the push and pull. This is the balance that we we're talking about earlier without financial implications attached to it. But in order to take the risk on an artist I've never presented before, but in whom I believe, 
one needs to make sure there are other places on the on the season where we know we're going to do pretty well so that we can so that we can afford to take these risks and in a financial and an artistic sense but also in an art an audience credibility sense you know if i booked an entire season of all artists that were totally new to the institution had never performed on that stage before and perhaps had never appeared in new york before i would be very surprised if much of the audience came no nope. Um, you know, they would have no reason to. They don't know me. They don't know my programming style. They don't know what I'm passionate about or interested in. Um, so any changes we want to make, going back to, to your very first question, we look at where the institution is. We chart a course in our heads for where we think it should be in 10 years. And then we start making very, very gradual changes, always with an eye towards building towards the next step, towards the next step. Um, and then in 10 years, we cast out again and see where should we be 10 years from now. Um, and all of this is through balance, through calculated risk with sure product. I hate to use that word, but it is apt. Mm -hmm. um, things that we know the market responds to combined with things that we don't know how the market will respond and combine it all. And this is where the art in artistic directorship really comes into it, combining it all to make a compelling season as a whole, something that an audience will want to come to and will ideally be inspired by. Now let's talk money. Um, <laughs> going back, I did not plan to this be the artist critic memorial conversation, but <laughs> I'm glad that it is. You know, in Funny Girl, there's a song, Who Taught Her Everything She Knows. My my take on arts management began there in, in terms of how to read a contract, how to write a contract, budgeting, and so on. And artists had what she called the 75-25 rule. In other words, if you're doing eight operas, six of them are the ones where you make your money. And that's that you have to earn the money you need for the year on those six. The other two, one of them might be an opera that is let's say a lesser known Donizetti or a little scene Wagner, but something that you don't know if you're going to make money on it, but you present it because artistically you want to do that in honoring operas past or back in that era when not everybody was doing handle operas all the time, a handle opera. Um, and then the other work would be a new commission or a revival of a re recent modern opera, either from the US or from Europe. And that one you didn't intend to make any money on. And if you did, good. If it suddenly turned out to be a hit that everyone wanted, like William Bolcom's A Wedding, then great, you made money on it. But that money was then plowed back into the fund for future use for development of other things. Um, so basically, she taught me that you have to do your season's budget and then figure out where the money will come from and hope good for the rest but not count on it many contemporary arts institutions especially a major opera company it's kind of like the roll of the dice in terms of what we'll earn and what will not and there seems not to be planning that way and it's unfortunate because these institutions are precious to us and they become very um very vulnerable and very you know it's like they're performing on melting ice and you don't want that because you want to keep the institution happy and healthy and, and have it a place where people want to come. At the same time, also doing new work. But um, not all institutions subscribe to 7525. Then there are the kinds of places elsewhere in the U.S. and certain other countries, but especially in the U.S., where basically it's Carmen Traviata, the Barber of Seville, and the you know, one other thing that maybe will be like uh, Tosca, who knows what, Bohem for the umpteenth <laughs> time. And that's not, our, those are masterpieces, but they're not artistic growth. And so therefore, when you guys, and yes, you're not an opera company, you are a concert presenter, um, sit down and budget. Do you budget with intentions for each program or do you budget for the season and think, okay, well, very popular Tony Award winning singer will bring in a bigger audience than recitalist from Peru. 
Um, I, I do both. Um, I, I, I think I probably start with, I, I guess I would say that I start with a concept in my head for what I think the season should look like and be. And then I sort of very roughly sketch out a budget for what I think that concept will do and then see where I am and then start to juggle a bit from there. I mean, I, I think that the luxury of being a concert presenter as opposed to an, an opera company um, is that my risks are comparatively small. You know, if I've, you know, over a multi-night run, having invested a couple of million dollars in a new production, that, that it's necessary. I mean, that that could be the company hanging in the balance if if I ill, yeah. if yeah, if, if ill chosen. My risks are somewhat smaller. Um, so if something doesn't do quite what we think it's going to, it's not necessarily a tragedy as a, as a sort of isolated case. Um, and as a result, I certainly take more risk than 75% of the, uh, than 25% of the season, I should say. Um, but yeah, we, we, we always need to keep an eye on the bottom line. There's always a sense of what we think things are going to do financially. Um, the bosses would be very upset if I missed the mark. Um, and, and certainly, you know, we want to make cases both to ourselves and to the audience and the community that we serve um, for the continued viability of the various art forms in which we work. And part of doing that, aside from the, the revenue of it, is just having good houses, you know, showing the audience that shows up that other people are also interested in what they're doing. So I, I think of the revenue, absolutely. Um, but I think of it in a broader sense about how, what that revenue is showing is the, the sort of paths to viability of, of our art forms. Um, it's a very basic question I'm going to ask, but one that so many people who do what you do, but I know not you, um, forget to do. Namely, if you're doing forward planning, do you take out a multi-year calendar and look where the Catholic, Muslim, Jewish holidays are, where election day is, where all of these things are, and say, wait a minute, we can't do it around this time or that time? How do you do that? Um, as as you might imagine, it's particularly complicated for me because I have you know the the usual holidays, and then I have to take into account all of the high holiday, the Jewish high holidays. Um, I, I we do look at at you know Eid and and some of the the Muslim holidays. They they are a little bit less um, off limits for us. Um, but certainly things we take into account when there are major, especially when, when there are intersections of multiples. Um, uh, I have a, I have a bookmark, uh, on my, on my web browser. Um, uh, one of the, uh, uh I think a Chabad from uh, maybe the university of Illinois or something has very kindly planned out all of the high holidays until like 2035 or something like that. And, um, and though this will sound, I'm sure, excruciatingly low tech to, to some folks in our business. I have multi-year Excel spreadsheets um, yeah. that just sort of list every date sequentially. Yeah. And then I have everything blacked out so that if some manager comes to me and says, well, for the 2029, 2030 season, you know, we're, we're planning this wonderful AI concert as I imagine they'll all be by then. Um, and I look at the date and I go, oh, well, I, I can't because it's right in the middle of Passover or something like that. Um, <laughs> I mean, sometimes I forget, and then I go back two years later and realize that I put something on Sukkot or or in the middle of Yom Kippur yeah. or something like that. But thankfully, it doesn't happen to me too much because I do have to, from an institutional perspective, I have to keep a very close eye on it. I'll tell you why I asked. Immediately before the pandemic hit the United States, my last trip out of New York in America for a job was to a major American city that has remarkable musical institutions, a great opera, a great orchestra, beautiful concert halls and theaters, and a devoted audience and so on. And it's also a city that is among the most successful in American football. And 
they, this institution, booked a fantastic cast and amazing conductor for Zalame and yours truly as the speaker. <laughs> there was no one there. <laughs> because I, I will was, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. It was Super Bowl yeah. Sunday. Yeah. And even though I, this city's <laughs> team did not make it all the way to the Super Bowl, this city is so football mad that everybody I mean it was so interesting that I couldn't find a restaurant to eat at after the <laughs> afternoon performance. We had a matinee. Um I couldn't find a restaurant to eat at because everything shut down in one of the largest cities in America because with a fantastic tradition of, believe me, of football, but also music of all kinds and academia, everything. I could not, it was, no one bothered to think when is Super Bowl Sunday in this famous football mad city. So <laughs> I do, I do note, um, we, we definitely note Super Bowl Sunday and election day. Um, we, we note election day internally because one of the many ways in which the 92nd street Y sort of the communities were, uh, were the local polling place. Um, okay. so during election day, there are people wandering in and out of the building all the time. Um, and, and this year, um, I did leave a very, very healthy, uh, time after the election day just in the off chance um i think I, we're going to need an ambulance and resuscitation equipment <laughs> yeah. uh yeah um but but as far as the super bowl is concerned new york is kind of is one of those strange places that nothing really seems to disrupt right. the daily life of the city new york um, so we have enough. we have programmed on super bowl sunday before do i do i don't think deleterious effect and our matinees are 2 p.m. so it may not matter um, actually i can point you to one thing that is kind of like the super bowl of that city or the jewish holiday of somewhere in new york the tony awards the yes tony awards and the marathon and the marathon you're right <laughs> november which is off right around election day the city is not navigable on marathon sunday and it's also full of wonderful people from around the world, and New Yorkers turn out and support them. It's great. But the Tony Awards are the equivalent of the Oscars for the New York theater world, and it's done usually on the second Sunday in June. And at least in Manhattan, nothing moves. Everyone is either attending the Tony Awards, watching the crowds at the Tony Awards, at watch parties. At, I mean, it was this past June. And I remember that it was blocked in my calendar. I arranged the food. I did everything. I had a chart to keep track of who the nominees were or who won. And and therefore, um, that's the one day, which leads me, I didn't plan to go in this direction. Um, among the singers you have coming is Alex Newell, who won the Tony Award last year. Right. Would you talk about how you <laughs> i'm picturing a corn pun but i'm not going there um how you encountered alex newell and how alex newell has wound up from winning a tony award to coming to the y and who alex newell is sure um so alex uh i first encountered alex and i'm, I'm afraid i'm going to date myself um because alex uh first came to my attention as a character on the on the tv show glee um which which um for for international folks was a relatively long-lived i said probably far longer than than the bounds of taste allowed um <laughs> a, a tv show about a, a high school uh a, a high school show choir um and the, the gimmick as it were, um, was that they the there were a lot of musical arrangements and, and the the cast actually performed. I mean, they lip synced on the show, but they performed the songs sort of in the context of the story. Um, it, it was it was actually pretty inventive television for its time. It was I probably went off the air about six or eight years ago now. Um, Alex was one of the main characters. Um, 
and then you know has gone from strength to strength, including recently, as you mentioned, Fred, um, winning a Tony for uh, their appearance in the Broadway musical Shocked, which was entirely yes about corn. Um, so much so that I briefly thought it was like bankrolled by the Iowa Corn Growers Association or something. I'm assured that's not the case. Um, but I, I remember thinking Alex was a pretty impressive talent when I was younger and watching TV, but totally unprepared um, for their onstage persona, which is, I mean, truly larger than life. I mean, Would they brought the house down to- every night. Would you explain why you're using the pronoun they and their? Uh, sure. Um, Alex is a, a transgender person. Um, I, I don't want to say too much more than that for fear of mischaracterizing them. Um, but uh, they have a huge vocal range, um, starting quite low and, and, and even into the belt, you know, way up into a head voice that is pretty sensational by any modern standards um and alex played a a a female character in in shocked uh sort of matronly type with a great deal of sass and attitude and had um and it had sort of the the big song in the show called independently owned um with some true truly saucy modulations and really (laughs) really significant flair um, and I just remember thinking, I, I nearly fell out of my chair. I thought, my God. I mean, and to do this eight shows a week, you know, is, is no small yeah. feat. Um, and as I was thinking of the planning and thinking, you know, we have, um, since COVID especially, we've been building out the sort of straight up American songbook uh, presenting side of our work. Um, because there are just, there are no venues in New York of any size aside from Carnegie Hall. Um, and a Broadway theater where most of these artists can can be themselves, can be themselves in performance. But Lincoln Center at the Rose Theater, Jazz at Lincoln Center, for a long time did American Songbook and had That's everybody right. from Chantuses, you know, the the Judy Collins and the, um, mm-hmm. I don't even know who's our Chantuse anymore, Marilyn May, two Broadway artists, two people like Stephanie Blythe from the opera world who can sing anything. Um and those were always quite wonderful. Are they no longer happening? They're they're fabulous. And I believe that series still exists. I think it is still called Great American Songbook or something like that. Um, I would say that my impression of the programming is that it's kind of moved away from the canonical American Songbook singers and more towards... Um, it has gone a little bit further afield. I mean, I think the, the ethos has maybe stayed the same. They just had John Holiday, the great countertenor, um, mm-hmm. do a do a program for that series. And then I think the rest, I saw the Indigo Girls were supposed to be on it, and I'm forgetting what the others, uh, the other two were. Um, so we've we've sort of moved into the the more American songbooky side of it with Kelly O'Hara and Audrey McDonald and Stephanie J. Block and that kind of work. And then in thinking of who else we might showcase, I thought of Alex, um, because I think they do a fantastic cabaret show. And in fact, they were just doing a show over Pride Weekend uh, at a smaller theater downtown. Um, and, and I was very pleased to be borne out. Um, their show was sensational. Songs from all of the great divas of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and today, to, to borrow a radio phrase. And, uh, and each one of them, done up more stunningly than the last. I mean, I don't know how they did it, but it was truly remarkable and gave me a lot of excitement to to hear what, what they'll do for us in, in May of next year, in May of 2025, that is. Um, so how do I put this? When I meet people in the Broadway and off-Broadway in the theater worlds, and I grew up with theater. I had a wonderful cousin who had a 52-year career in Broadway theater and so on. And and I met many people through her and went to Tony Awards and so on. But I grew up and worked professionally and worked professionally in the opera world, in classical music, but primarily opera. And when I meet people from Broadway and from the theater, and I say, I'm in opera, 
we sort of look at one another with admiration and a little bit of confusion. And I would say, well, you know, we're cousins. We do really the same kind of stuff with a few differences. Number one, in opera, we don't use amplification. Number two, we have limited runs in opera and it's not destined to make money. Whereas if you mount a Broadway musical, the hope is you also make money um, in addition to doing something artistically valid. But many producers will produce things, in other words, the people who pay for it. There's another thing. In opera, a producer is the stage director. In Broadway, the producers are the people who give the money to launch the show and hope to make some money back. Um, and our scenery in opera is a little more elaborate often. Um, Broadway people are so-called triple threats that they can sing, act, and dance. There is a lot more show-stopping applause in theater, in musical theater, whereas there is a lot of jaw-dropping singing done without amplification in opera, but they're all wonderful. They're just a little different. So would the 92nd Street Y audience know of Alex Newell? I mean, Shuck turned out to be a charming show that I avoided because why did I want to see a show about corn? But it was charming, and I heard about Alex Newell, and I heard the other cast members were good, and I liked to see what's being done. And it had a very good book and, and was fine. I, I enjoyed a lot more than other musicals. But um, when I heard Alex Newell, I was thinking, where can they go next and what will they do next? Because many people would not think to cast them in a traditional, I mean, Hello, Dolly, I don't know, maybe one day. <laughs> Who knows? She can. They can sing it, but um, who knows? And how do you build an audience? So therefore, when you invited Alex Newell to come perform next season, was it purely artistic or were you building an audience or do you think that they bring an audience already? And if they do, they're not necessarily your audience. That's right. I think it's a combination of several things. I mean, I think Alex has a great following on their own. Um, I think that we have been building on that side of our programming a somewhat younger audience, which I think will respond well to seeing Alex on our stage. Uh, and indeed, the early sales suggest so, which is uh, heartening. Um, and for those those of our folks who know you know, kind of the big stars of the musical theater world, I think it's perfectly reasonable for us and indeed necessary to hold Alex and folks like them up and say, this is the next generation of that, which I do believe is true. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a bit of serving the audience we have and, and the new audience that we're building, a bit of bringing the folks that know Alex to our place, um, and then ideally getting them involved in other aspects of our programming. Um, so it's, it. I mean, the ideal for something like this is it's a bit symbiotic, right? That, you know, we're able to serve our audience and in turn bring a new audience, which we can then hopefully continue to serve um, in future years. I mean, and, and to your point about what, what's next for Alex, I think one of the really nice things about musical theater which is somewhat different from opera um, or, or, or opera in the current day is that there's tons of new work being created every year for big stages. There's a lot of, well, I mean, let's be frank about it. There's a lot of money floating around in that side of the business. There are a lot of houses. There's a big, big audience. It's a huge tourist market. Um, so perhaps Alex is next. I, I say this with no knowledge, I should say, but perhaps Alex is next work is a piece that hasn't even been written yet. And musical theater is somewhat loath in a way that opera is not to characterize, I mean, there is not such a formal Fach system in musical theater. Of course there is, but it's much more malleable. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I agree with you that I think, you know, they're cousins and all come from the same Genesis. I mean, you can probably trace it all back to Zauberflot and, and work like that. You know, it, it, it all sits or in that entertaining. Go even much further yeah, back. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. 
I happen you to know, miss it all. It all sits in that. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 and, and by so, and, and by so close too. <laughs> I know, I know. I was, you know, I was going to something by Hildegard von Bingen. <laughs> <laughs> she, she called me up. Um, I just want to be clear about one thing you said. When you said there are a lot of houses with a lot of money, did you mean opera houses or Broadway theaters? Oh, sorry. I'm in. I'm in Broadway theaters. There's a. There's okay, a. You know. Then I'm going to push back a bit and argue that this happens to be a golden age for the creation of new opera, and that Absolutely. in fact many theaters, the Met all over Europe, but places like Des Moines and Dallas and mm -hmm. Santa Fe and San Francisco, I can name them all. Detroit, yeah, yeah. Cincinnati, Philadelphia are presenting lots of new operas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when people say to me, how come they don't do, you know, Nabucco anymore, or they don't do it very often, Nabucco being Verdi's first masterpiece? Um, the answer is, there are a lot of Verdi operas we never see because they just didn't really work out. You know, not many people see Thus Leaveth for Boda de Fay and or even Rienzi by Wagner. I try to. Um, and there are many Donizetti operas of the 22 works Mozart wrote for musical theater, we see seven, maybe eight, which means that most of them are not seen. And therefore, with new operas, if composer R com creates a work that's a masterpiece and then her next piece is just okay, people say, well, I don't need to see that again. And my answer is, we do want to see it again. We want to support it and maybe it didn't get a good first production. There are a lot of famous nights in musical theater in opera history, such as Traviath and Barbara Seville. There were fiascos at their openings and had to be represented and had to be staged differently and have different cast members and so on. That's what happens. And who now would say that Barbara Seville and, and Traviath are not masterpieces? But um, so for that in mind, I would say that cousin that we are we in the opera world are doing a lot right now it's a wonderful period for new opera and and a I lot could, of I, I couldn't agree more people like anthony roth costanza devon tynes julia bullock who you're having um stephanie Blythe, karen slack who you're having there are many people out there in the opera world christine gurky who are creating new stuff or finding new ways to present or reach new audiences jamie barton leah crochetto i can name many 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 who are doing this good work but they're not always noticed and i just they're named americans but there are many europeans and asians and south americans who are doing this as well and you know i believe it's your job as a presenter my job as quote an expert uh, and also a presenter of this kind of program to bring to the world's attention people like that um i had karen slack on the show three plus years ago and she was terrific and people can go to youtube and enter fred plot and karen slack and it was one of the best recordings of conversations that i did on fred plot on fridays because she's a great artist and tell me how you notice karen slack and why you're bringing her and in what by the way she's sure. an author. Um... Aaron Slack is a yes. great Toronto from Philadelphia. She's she's absolutely ph phenomenal, and um, I mean to to respond to your initial point, then I'll, I'll talk about Karen. Um, I totally agree. We're we're in a a golden age of the creation of new opera. I think your point about remembering that not everything is a success on the first night is a very important one, especially as we're seeing so much new work. Um, and I also think it's incumbent on all of us to remember that you know, I'll, I'll be slightly flip for the sake of time and say that a premiere is relatively easy. Getting the second show, yes. getting the second show, getting the second run is often significantly more difficult, but it's incumbent on, on us, especially the, the programmers and the folks behind the scenes and artistic planning to evaluate all of this work that we're seeing and think, well, could we do it differently? Would that make it more or less successful? Um, because it, it, it's it's a real loss um, to see work only once. Um, you know, sometimes it sometimes the time has not yet arrived for a piece. 
and um, then we can come back in 20 years and call it a masterpiece. And sometimes, you know, sometimes pieces kind of get lost in the shuffle of time. I think of, you know, Carlisle Floyd's work, and Anthony and Cleopatra, you know, all, all of this work that just sort, sort of lives somewhere, but isn't done quite so much anymore. I'm just going to interrupt. I was going to mention Anthony and Cleopatra, yeah. which Samuel Barber and... Um... And uh, who, who the famous composer wrote the libretto and Frank was ever fully directed, starred Husino Diaz and Leatine Price, September 16, Minotti, 1966, yeah. opening, thank you, John Carlo Minotti, opening the Metropolitan Opera House. And Zeffirelli put every idea he had on the stage, and the scenery broke, and Miss Price was wonderful, and Husino Diaz was wonderful. But everyone said, eh, it was not such a good opera. <laughs> and that's not true. But it got lost in the shuffle. And frankly, here we go again. The artist Kranich said, Fred, we're going to bring back Anthony and Cleopatra and we're going to do it better than that. I won't use the word she used, Met Production. And uh, <laughs> they did in the 1990s. And it was glorious. And it began to reintroduce the piece to the repertory. And that took from 1966 to 1992. So a whole generation never so, saw it. Yeah. And and of course, these things do sometimes take that kind of time. It takes a visionary. And and goodness knows we're not all visionaries. And, some, and, and we're not all equally passionate about everything that we see. But, you know, the, for me, there's rarely a stronger... There's really a, a stronger program um, than seeing a visionary artist who's passionate about something wanting to find a way in to tell that story. And with that rather elegant segue, I'll say, <laughs> I can talk about Karen. Um, you know, I've been aware of Karen now for four or five years, I think, um, have been a great admirer of her work. And then the phone rings one day and it's her manager talking about um, a project that Karen has designed. Um, and as they're telling me the story, I'm thinking, I'm sitting in my office thinking, this is exactly the kind of program the Y loves and that I love, you know, an artist who's deeply passionate about something, finding their way to tell a story. Um, and and the, the program that she's devised is called African Queens. Um, it tells the stories, the stories rather of seven African Queens, some or rather, I should say Queens of the African Diaspora, because it does move into um, the Afro-Caribbean uh, world somewhat. Um, some of them very historical, some of them a little bit more proto-historical. Some of the stories verge uh, start with a historical basis and verge into mythology. Um, and Karen has engaged uh, a group of fantastic composers um, to write songs that respond to or set the texts of um, these stories. Um, and through them, um, Karen has interwoven some um, older music um, uh, from Florence Price, from Samuel Coleridge Taylor, um, some really interesting work um, that, that kind of helps to flesh out and provide moments of respite as these stories are being told. She's doing that um, with a fantastic pianist, Kevin Miller. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just I, I've seen the scores of, of just a couple of the pieces and you know, the stylistic breadth that the composers are using to tell these stories is just fantastic. And it'll be a perfect showcase for, I mean, Karen's many, many gifts. Um, you know, she's one of, I think, one of our greatest interpreters of a song and of a lyric, you know, and, and she'll have a lot to do with, with these stories. And it's going to be a really, really fun program for us. Um, it's interesting about Karen whose nickname is Kiki, which is how I know her. Um, I met her when she was very, very, very young, and I was young, <laughs> to give, it, to give it <laughs> the contrast. And I met her because she, at the last minute, made a sudden Metropolitan Opera debut as the, in the title role of Verdi's Louisa Miller and did a great job, but nobody was quite ready for her and there was no one to say, hey, let's use her in this, that. The Met plant so far ahead that there was no place for her. And I happened to be at that. I met her because I happened to be there that night. And she was sensational. And 
but then she I wouldn't say she vanished, but then she went back to the beginning artist career with a fantastic med credit to her credit. Um, and I kept often people would ask me, can you find me a soprano who can do X, Y, and Z? I would always say Karen Slack, who has the right voice, temperament, acting, everything. And only now, I mean, she, I recently went to her New York Philharmonic debut back in May singing Mozart, and she was terrific with Jane Glover conducting. And she's making all of these debuts now that maybe she should have done before. And I'm not blaming her at all. I'm blaming the presenters who didn't seem to understand, or I'm going to be blunt here, they only needed a limited number of black sopranos every year, and they would have other black sopranos, wonderful too. I'm not here to pit one against the other. But, um, you know, Karen was often sort of the third choice if the other two were not available. And I know that I and other people who really know our music say those other two are great, but Karen is as good as the other two. And only recently have people begun to notice, and I'm very happy for that, and she's been an artistic advisor in Canada, in Portland, Oregon, and different things like that. And she created during the pandemic a program on the internet that people began to discover her brain in addition to her heart and her soul and her music. And that benefited her. And I don't see where every artist is able to do that, but she very resourcefully took the confinement that we all had during the pandemic and during the worst part of the pandemic because we still have it um and and she used it to good effect and so I, i'm very happy that because i've not seen african queens i'm very happy that when i read your entire list of everything coming that caught my eye um i also well, i can't name everything and and what is the website so people find it the website is 92ny.org slash concerts. So 92 for the street, NY for New York City, dot org for organization slash concerts. We'll repeat that again. You got it. Um, but another thing that caught my eye, because I have friends there, um, is the Australian Chamber Orchestra. And afterwards, I'll tell you who my friends are and we can, we'll discuss, so to speak. Um and I'm very interested for all kinds of reasons. Number one, because I have friends there. But number two, because um, I was a Venetian history major in college. And this is focusing on Vivaldi, the Venice of Vivaldi. Uh, this is catnip for someone like me. Um, <laughs> even though I'm an opera guy, well, Vivaldi wrote operas, but I don't only love opera. I think you and I share a philosophy, even if we've not said it. I grew up in a household that had the Duke Ellington rule. Basically, there are only two good, there are two types of music, good music and the other kind. And so <laughs> therefore, Vivaldi played by the Australian Chamber Music Orchestra is good music. And Karen Slack doing African good music. And the Rolling Stones is really good music. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, I, I it looks like it's your first one of your first programs. It's October, so soon, um, 2024. The Australian Chamber Orchestra, the Ottoman Four Seasons. That's fabulous. Tell us, tell us it, more. <laughs> it, 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 it really is. And I have to give all credit to Richard Tognetti, who's the the sort of madcap genius behind the Australian Chamber Orchestra. You know, Richard is, you know one of one of the great musical minds is just constantly drawing from multiple places multiple influences um and thinking about how um music and sometimes video sometimes lighting can can create a world mm -hmm. um so he's done previous projects that that talk about um, the ocean which of course you know especially in australia and especially with the great barrier reef and, and its current travails is, is provoking a lot of discussion um, and, and Richard, Richard's conceit about, um, Vivaldi and the Four Seasons is, is to talk about how 
Venice was, as, as you well know, Fred, uh, a real center of commerce and really in, in many ways sort of the gateway um, into Italy and, and Western Europe from the Ottoman Empire and points east. And so his point in sort of in in designing this program is to say that Vivaldi was probably, in his view, pretty heavily influenced by Eastern musical traditions, which were sort of perfuming the air in Venice, as, along with the spices that that came with them, um, at the time of Vivaldi's writing. Uh, and indeed, he's he's engaged um, two fantastic um, musicians to help sort of flesh out this concept: um, Joseph Tardros and, and James Tardros, um, who each play um, traditional instruments, um, which as as with many traditional Eastern instruments have unusual tuning um, arrangements. And it was discovered as they were working out this program that indeed a lot of the Four Seasons sits beautifully on top of some of these alternate tuning structures, prompting them to think, you know, I think to really have an aha moment. Um, so Richard has, Richard has those instruments um, playing in a, in a slightly rearranged Four Seasons. I mean, it, it is eminently identifiable, but there are some unusual touches. And then inter, and then he's interwoven um, various types of Eastern music or music largely from the Ottoman Empire, um, which it, in and of itself encapsulates a few hundred musical traditions um, to sort of elucidate and draw out these moments of the Vivaldi where you might see um, a wink or a nod to um, to the music that Vivaldi was hearing probably on the streets of Venice. Um, it's, a, it's a really, really nifty program and we're thrilled to get to bring it to New York and I'm thrilled to get to see Richard and, and the ACO again. It's always a blast. Um, they, are, they are a really fun bunch. While you were speaking, the question came to my head and it's not glib. It sounds glib, but it's really not. Um, when I've taught Vivaldi's Four Seasons and the three movements in each of the Four Seasons and how, you know, kind of like with astrology, they're the first 10 days, the next 10 days, the next 10 days of a month or a sign, um, and how you can hear the general transitions of nature in the Veneto um, and the arrival of birds and weather and so on. We now have climate change. And I wonder whether those traditional descriptions you know, kind of like holes with the planets and these other things where we know more or know different things, how that's going to affect our perception of the teaching of the four seasons. Yeah, I mean, I I, I don't think it's glib at all. And I, I suppose there is a very real possibility that in, I hesitate to put a number on it, but in, in, a, in a not entirely long, you know, a not incredibly lengthy amount of time, we'll have to teach people what the seasons were along yeah. with what, what this the is. The birds that came and where yeah. they nested and the, the currents and the tides and all that. And the arrival of yeah. flowers and plants and fruit and everything. Mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, general question that I think I know you have thoughts about, it, even though we've never discussed it. Um, in New York, when we're talking about our big musical institutions and presenters, I mentioned many of them, uh, one being BAM, one being Carnegie Hall, another, all the constituents of Lincoln Center, uh, the universities, Columbia University, the music the music schools like Juilliard and Manus and Manhattan School of Music. And I'm really just taking the top, the 92nd Street Y, of course, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which has the Grace Brady Rogers Auditorium. Most of these institutions are, quote, musical presenters. The 92nd, or except for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is an art museum with a theater and they present. The 92nd Street Y, and I'm going to add another institution, New York Public Radio. WNYC WQXR, which turned 100 years old on July 8th of 2024, and I hope to cover that in some way, um, is also a cultural institution and a news organization. But many of these places are primarily about putting stuff on the stage. 
the 92nd Street Y and to some degree BAM are also schools or educational institutions. And the education programs, and obviously Juilliard and, and Manus and so on, are linked to the musical offerings. And um, I've done a lot of this kind of teaching at BAM and certain other, at NYU, I teach opera. And it used to be that I was a regular, not just me, this is not about me, other people, colleagues of mine were regular teachers and presenters at the Metropolitan Opera, at the New York City Opera, at the New York Philharmonic, at many of the, at Carnegie Hall um, more recently, many of these places no longer have or have radically cut their educational programs. And I say this all the time, that there's a massive difference between marketing and public relations over here and education over there. And they don't mix, you don't market education. You educate or you try to market and promote. But institutions that have merged them into communication, for example, and and shut down or reduce their education departments, uh, I think pay for it with lower audience attendance and less engagement with audiences. I say this to ask the following. The 92nd Street Y is also an educational institution, very much so. So how is your institution, your job, your mission different from almost all these other places that are not educational institutions and those like Juilliard that are tend to educate first to their students, but not the public. Juilliard does to the public. I don't want to get the wrong impression, but it's different from the intensity of the education that goes to students. And then these students do wonderful performances. That's right. Um, I, the the mission is some is is considerably different in that when I'm putting together a season, I am constantly feeding my colleagues in our various educational departments ideas, topics of discussion, points of possible connection. Um, that I see in the programs that I'm booking and, and what they have, have expressed an interest in doing. Um, the why, one, one of the why's many great benefits is that it has a lot of different streams of educational work. Um, just, to, just to name two, um, we have our School of Music uh, run by my fantastic colleague, Jana Stotland, um, which not only teaches private and group lessons for piano, guitar, drums, all that sort of thing, um, but also puts on fantastic courses, often keyed to um, a particular program or a particular thread that runs through a season. For example, we have Ian Bostridge singing Vinterizer um, in the spring of 2025. And I'm, I'm not saying they will, but Jana might decide that that's a program worth having a class or series of classes around, both because Ian's written a book on Vinterizer and because there's so much... Mm -hmm to say about Venturiza, of course, all of it's been said before, but it's nice to keep exposing a new audience to the psychodrama behind that piece, I think. Um, we also, as a result of, of COVID, when we were live streaming a lot of things, we have an, an online educational component called Round Table, um, which has all sorts of different people teaching classes on all kinds of different things um, a lot of topics relating to the arts. And so they might also decide to pick up and 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 their reach is even broader still and their their remit broader still. So they might pick up uh, on the Australian Chamber Orchestra's Ottoman Four Seasons and do a course about uh, about the Silk Road or the spice trade from the Ottoman Empire into Venice and its implications on art and culture in the in the region. But I don't know that they will, but they could. Um, so we're always thinking, if, if, even if I'm not programming necessarily with those ideas clearly in mind, um, I'm always looking at what people are sending and, and what work we're doing that might prompt interesting debate or conversation in the educational aspects of our institution. And we hear from our audience over and over again that those who engage in, in the educational components come away um, from the concerts with a greater sense of understanding and a purpose. And, and even if my 
goal is primarily to entertain. You know, I want an audience to feel good about the time they've spent in our halls. Um, knowing that we've also perhaps deepened their understanding of an issue or a question or a period in history or a group of people, um, that makes art mean something. And certainly what art means to me doesn't have to be what it means to you, but it should ideally all mean something. It should, should mean something to everybody. And if we give people a hook or a different way of thinking about it, um, then I think we've done our jobs really well. And it's, I think at an institution like the Y, or maybe primarily at institutions like the Y, because both things are equally as important to our mission, the, the cultural work and the educational work, um, that we, we have a really well-devoted audience to, to both aspects of it. It's very special for that in that, um, yes. you know, as I said, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, magnificent place to see art and they have a wonderful auditorium and good programming. Um, but education, musical and, and performing arts education has fallen away somewhat. Um, their art, visual art education has also changed in a lot of ways. Um, I, I'm also thinking, well, you said something before I want to pick up on that when I worked at the Metropolitan Opera, I remember one year we then had the New York City Opera across Lincoln Center Plaza at the New York State Theater. And it was about a 90 second walk from our building to their building. And to use a word from before, we were cousins. It's a wonderful company, the City Opera, and they presented all the great artists and wonderful opera that the Met didn't present. But they also had their meat and potatoes, bread and butter opera, uh, pasta and cheese opera, whatever one you want. Um, and they would, for example, always do Cavalli Rusticana and Pagliacci and Bohem on the same Saturday. Do you know why? Avpag and because it was the one day in which they made their whole budget. <laughs> no, that's the one no, day. I can't say that I do offhand. Rent a horse for the whole day, and you don't. <laughs> <laughs> so you often had Tag and Bohem on Saturdays. But I remember that, you know, there was one time when they were doing Cav Pag and we were doing Cav Pag on the same night. And they were doing Traviata and we were doing Traviata and in repertory. And I kept, I asked my then boss there, why didn't you call them up and say, this is what we planned five years ahead. So let's help our little cousin. Um, that if you were thinking of doing Traviata, just know the Met is on March, whatever, the Met is doing Traviata on these dates. So maybe you don't want to do Traviata at the same time. Now, yes, um, I remember the New York critic at the times at the, at the times at the time wrote an article comparing the Traviatas and that's fine. That's great. But it's a little hard for building your audiences to have both. And, you know, Traviata masterpiece, but we want as much variety as possible in our city. And all of you presenters are doing great work. And it's a shame if it's taken down by the fact that someone else is doing something similar. This leads to the question of if you're dealing with a manager, which is to say, the person who manages the career of a musician. Um, and she says to you that you can have mezzo-soprano J, but only if you promise not to present so-and-so. Or we want the exclusive for mezzo-soprano J at the 92nd Street Y. Or... Um, Mezzo soprano J, you have to bring her back three seasons. Or here's a big one, because Mezzo soprano J is such a big star, you also have to get Mezzo soprano J. You also have to use our new little tenor R next season. Otherwise, you can't have Mezzo soprano J. There was a manager who did that. He had a huge soprano on his roster. And to get that soprano, you had to use five other people from his roster. So he collected multiple feeds. Um, I don't know if that still happens. It did 
30 years ago when this artist was in her prime. And do you deal with managers who set conditions and what the conditions are? And how do you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, of course, every manager, um, you know, is attempting to do their best for their artist, and, and that's their job. And um, they do sometimes set conditions. Um, I think I got four that you were particularly interested in. The, the first being that if, if I had somebody, I wouldn't have somebody else. And I would say absolutely not to that. The manager doesn't decide what I do or don't have on a season. And, and I've never been asked, for the record, I've never been asked such a thing. Um, uh, if a manager said, well, we want the exclusive appearance of, in New York of Soprano J or Mezzo Soprano J, um, that would probably be fine. I mean, that's what we mostly want too. Um, certainly the prevailing wisdom the the wisdom received from from our great forebears on high is that the best way to make a market for somebody in especially in a crowded city is to have the one exclusive appearance or certainly the exclusive recital appearance because we work very well with our colleagues at the Metropolitan Opera or the New York Philharmonic if somebody's playing a concerto at the Philharmonic maybe we can have them for recital or if somebody's doing an opera at the Met perhaps we could have them for recital um, you know th in those ways we work nicely together and nobody seems too terribly worried about one thing affecting the other. Um, a multi-season engagement, um, those certainly occur. Um, it, it's very situational. Going back to our very early conversation about the 11 year reign of, of Soprano X at the Chicago Lyric. Um, it, it, I would certainly entertain such an idea. It very much depends on who and what. Um, and if a multi-year commitment, it's always nice to have like a, a point to it. Um, you know, I, I think of Angela Hewitt, the wonderful Canadian pianist, now is in London and Umbria, um, who did uh, a multi-year commitment at the Y and she played the complete um, keyboard works of, of Bach. You know, uh, Hannah uh, had the the great wisdom to commit to that um, because it was it was an event and indeed it was. You um, read my mind. <laughs> and then I, and then I think the the la and 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 we were thrilled to be able to do it. It, it, it was a wonderful experience, a great musical moment uh, for our audiences who still think of it, especially those who saw twelve programs, still yeah. think of it as one of the greatest musical experiences they've had. Um, so. Perhaps, uh, and then the last. And she's thankfully, she would be coming back, right? Yes, she is. Okay. Uh, she'll be back in in late October, yeah. um, performing a, a mixed program including uh, the aforementioned Brahms Handel variations, along with Bach uh, Chromatic Fantasy and Fugue, um, Mozart C Minor Sonata K four five seven, and uh, Handel Chacon the G Minor Chacon. Um, she's one of our audience's favorites. One of my favorites. It's always great to have her. Um, in our hall. And I think your last condition was you can have very exalted person on our roster provided you also book perhaps somewhat less exalted person on our roster. I, again, have never personally encountered this. I've, I've heard tell it still happens. Um, and maybe. Uh, probably unlikely, if only because I don't like the premise, I, 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 I worry about that as an ethical matter. But if we like both, maybe. I, mean, I, I don't think I'd use it as a negotiating tactic. That, I always said, no way. I want to behave ethically and I'm not horse trading. And it's not that I, you know, if I get this great soprano that I'll have these others because artists in the back of my head said, you have to think of your audience first. That's right. And, you know, if those other artists, maybe one of them would grow up to be a great artist, who knows, but it's not my job to put a credit on their program at the Med or the Lyric or La Scala um, because I was pressured by a manager. Part of why I bring this up is because I know you know all this stuff, but I want our listeners to understand some of what is behind this. And I would venture to say, and I wonder what you think, 
I think the business has changed, and I think for the better in that regards, in terms of there is more collegiality among the institutions, such as, as you said, the Metropolitan Opera and Carnegie Hall, the Y and, and other institutions. Um, but also because I think the business has changed. I think yeah. that in some ways, unfortunately, artists are still treated awfully, some artists. Um, in some ways, uh, we are missing out on great people, great musicians, great, what do I want to call them? Great artists. Very simply, people have something to say in one way or another, whatever their art form is. Um, because we are slavishly driven by media by social media by the managements and by all those different factors and um you are i guess i am too but you certainly are what a wonderful italian friend of mine uses about I me mean, i feel embarrassed but i know what he's saying you're an arbiter you're the person who brings his taste and experience and knowledge and all of that to bear on what is worth putting in front of an audience. And that's a responsibility. And there's no training to be an arbiter. There's just not. And, you know, when my friend says this about me, I really feel he's trying to not flatter me, but honor me with a compliment. And I appreciate it. But it is a little embarrassing because an arbiter suggests an expert. It also suggests someone, and you are, suggest someone who maybe knows more and you know sometimes an arbiter of taste might be diana vreeland or what's her name uh anna wintour who will say this designer's in this designer's out um an arbiter is not a referee an arbiter right. is someone whose taste and sensitivity and evolution knows how to bring something of value forth to more people not for commercial ends because if you present an artist who you know is good we're talking about the one-third audience of of german pianists um you're an arbiter doing that you're not a referee doing that. am i on the right track do you do you experience that in yourself yes i i think you're very much on the right track it's you know it's it's a as you're sort of elucidating, it's a complicated series of judgments to make anything happen. On the one hand, there is our very personal taste, which is developed through just living, you know, growing up and being educated in a world and listening, hopefully widely and deeply. Um, and through that, we develop a certain way of thinking about the world and the art forms and what we think it's important to convey. The other is the market. Um, what the market wants, what the audience needs, what we think is deficient in it and looking to change. Um, and then... And then, of course, there's sort of the X factor, the kind of trivia of it. And all of that is brought to bear in putting a season together. And I, I say to my friends all the time that I live in a world where there are very few correct answers. It's, it's rare that there is a choice that we can make that is absolutely 100% right. There was no other way that it could have gone. Um, but we have to use our taste and our judgment and our knowledge um, combined with our understanding of the world in which we operate to make the best decisions we can at the time. Uh, I've certainly made decisions that I wish I hadn't. And I hope as I, you know, get more and more experience doing this, you know, do this for longer and longer. I will be a little bit more, you know, I don't think I have a bad track record by any means, but you know, it's, it's oh. nice to, if it's you nice did, to I continue to see, to you. <laughs> <That's probably true. laughs> but it's nice to continue over a long period of time to see your work born out again and again as important or interesting or things that people like to see. Um, 
it's a it's a strange it's a strange set of circumstances that we have to consider with every decision we make but um it is that very unusual juxtaposition of things that make the job so fun. I mean, I, I also often say if I programmed a season that was entirely about what I like, you know, what, what I, what I aesthetically pleases me, it would not, I mean, it would look a lot like the season I programmed, but the, the, perhaps the biggest misconception I think about the job that I do is that we just book what we like, you know, you you arrive at a, a series, you take it over, you make 20 phone calls to the 20 artists who you love, and there they are, and that's the season. I, if only it were that simple, but for any number of reasons, it's not. You know, there's there's an audience and a market and an institution and a city to take into account. Mm -hmm. um, all of those things are at least as important as what I think about anything. Yeah. And so, you know, the aesthetic judgments we make are less what I personally love and less about did that person absor observe the subido piano in measure 20 and a lot more about do I respect that? Do I think of that as a strong case for whatever art form the person engages in? If so, they, find, they might find a place on the season and if not, yeah. perhaps not. So, Rusotto, you said to me is a Sicilian surname. Where in Sicily? Bizzacchino. In the metropolitan state of Palermo. And have you been there? No, not to Sicily, alas. It's on my list, but I keep not getting there. Um, but I've traveled a, a, <laughs> not nearly as well as... <laughs> not, not, not nearly as well as you in Italy, but um, uh, it is one of my favorite places. <laughs> you grew up in Connecticut. That's right. Which has a large Italian pop Italian American population. Mm -hmm. um, do you have an opinion, Mr. Arbiter, on the pizza wars between New York City and Connecticut? Oof. Um, I can neatly sidestep it and, and say that one of the best Neapolitan style pizzas I've had in the metropolitan area was actually in New Jersey. Um, ah. <laughs> but but I am but I am a great fan but I'm a great fan of modern and in uh, New Haven. Um, I I mean I can make an argument for pizza in basically any form. I grew up eating very bad suburban pizza. Yeah. I, I I much later understood what pizza was supposed to be when I went to Naples the first time, uh, and now I can make I can make a good argument for anything at basically any time it's you know it's a situational thing for me i back in may went to hear the rolling stones in new jersey and i love the rolling stones uh, keith richard their guitarist what wrote in this wonderful memoir that mick jagger is a combination of james brown and maria collis and that's the best description <laughs> i've ever heard of mick jagger and mick jagger <laughs> always has this bigger on the zeitgeist in that James Brown, if he knew that the city had, you know, some event happen, he would address it in his concerts. And Mick Jagger back in May said, I cannot do his accent, but I heard that you got a pizza war going on here and New York City, you know, and people cheer from New York City and Brooklyn in the house, people from Brooklyn would cheer. He'd go through all the five boroughs of New York City and then say, but I read it's not as good as Connecticut. And the people from Connecticut would cheer. And then he said, <laughs> well, we're in New Jersey. And I think New Jersey has the best. Right, New, right, New Jersey? Yeah. And then they played, you can't always get what you want. <laughs> <laughs> now that's smart programming. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, Nicholas Russo, I was going to say Risotto, that's me. Russo. Thank you very much. You do wonderful work. And I was so happy well, to have the chance to talk to you. And thank you, Fred. It was a delight. And thank you for educating our audience. Because what you do is crucial in our world. And most people have no clue what a presenter, what a manager, what a programmer does. Because they see the people who are in front of us or they read about the, the conductors or 
designers or whatever, but they don't meet the person who does your job, and that's fundamental. So I thank you very much. Thank you.